Well, good evening, and I want to ask you to open your Bible up to the book of Zechariah. As you do that, let me just take a moment to say that certainly this is not what we expected to be doing tonight. We had been expecting to meet together here in the building, but we've had a number of our folks to get sick, to be exposed, and our area is just overrun with COVID right now and to try to bring things under control. The elders have decided that we would not meet together in the building tonight, but I'm certainly glad that you can be with me through this live stream. And I do want to encourage you to open your Bible to the book of Zechariah. Our lesson tonight will primarily be taken from the first couple of chapters, but I want to take a moment and talk about why the book of Zechariah. This month, we'll wrap up the end of our two years of Old Testament studies in the auditorium class. About two years ago, we embarked on a new program where we are trying to have all of our classes unified with the auditorium class one quarter ahead. Next quarter, the rest of the classes will finish up the Old Testament. But one of the key things that happens in the last quarter study is the rebuilding of the temple at Jerusalem and the rebuilding of the walls of the city of Jerusalem. Well, the rebuilding of the wall, of the, I'm sorry, the temple of Jerusalem, it took, began to happen about 537, 536 B.C. And as we read in the book of Ezra, as we read in Haggai and Zechariah, a combination of things put a stop to the building. There was opposition from without. There were misplaced priorities among those who had come back. And there was discouragement in that this remnant was not going to be able to build the kind of temple that they had had before the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. And so things just ground to a halt. And then about 520 B.C., God raised up two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, to get the people building again. And they were very successful along with Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel the governor. The people got busy and the temple was completed in four years. Well, in our class material as we go through the Old Testament, we study this in the historical book of, es of Ezra. We take a little, a brief look at Haggai. But because of time, we don't use the book of Zechariah in our studies. And I thought it would be good for us to have at least some familiarity with this great book. Zechariah is a fascinating book. It is a book that has a lot of visions and symbols, and so you can't read it in a literalistic fashion, but it's very profitable. In the ninth chapter, in verse 9, we read, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Of course, we are familiar with this prophecy of Christ as He fulfilled in the literal sense riding into Jerusalem upon the donkey in order that he might become that king that would reign, as it says, from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. The book of Zechariah was written to a people urging them to rebuild the physical temple. But the physical temple that was being built, as later under Nehemiah, as the physical city is being rebuilt, these really foreshadow the building of the spiritual city, 
the spiritual kingdom. Look at Hebrews, the 12th chapter, and then we'll give our attention to Zechariah. But Hebrews, the 12th chapter, to New Testament Christians, we have these words. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Just stop for a second think what he's saying. Those who have come to Jesus, those who have been washed by His blood, those who make up the church of the firstborn ones, are also a part of the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God, Mount Zion. There was a physical place called Mount Zion, but now there is the spiritual Zion. He goes on to admonish them not to fail to listen to God. See that you do not refuse Him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused Him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from Him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now He is promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. I would point out in verse 26, the quotation about shaking is from the book of Haggai, the contemporary with Zechariah, the man whose mission was much the same as that of Zechariah's. And by talking about shaking, he was talking about God shaking the nations of the earth, you know, taking and upsetting them. And the Hebrew writer says, but we have a kingdom that cannot be shaken. As we turn back to Zechariah, I want us to appreciate what the message was to the people of that time what he was saying to them. But I also want us to realize that Zechariah all along was looking forward. Well, let's say this. The Holy Spirit was using Zechariah to look forward to a spiritual Jerusalem, a spiritual temple, a spiritual kingdom. But chapter 1 begins this way. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, the prophet, saying, The Lord has been very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets preached, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Turn now from your evil ways and your evil deeds. But they did not hear nor heed me, says the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? Yet surely my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So they returned and said, Just as the Lord of hosts determined to do to us according to our ways and according to our deeds, so he has dealt with us. Zechariah, in a book that is largely an encouragement to the people to rise up and build, starts out by saying, Do you remember what happened to your fathers? Do you remember the captivity? Do you remember the former prophets, he calls in verse 4? 
Those would be the men like Jeremiah and Habakkuk and Zephaniah, Ezekiel, and maybe going back even a little farther to Isaiah and Micah and others who spoke to the fathers and said, turn from your evil ways and your evil deeds. But Zechariah reminds them they didn't listen. And they paid the price for it. And he's begging them, if you're going to be blessed, you're going to have to, verse 3, return to me and I will return to you. They had to come back to God. When Haggai and Zechariah began to try to stir the people up, the people were facing some very difficult times. There was famine, there, there, were other, there, were, there was opposition from outside. But he begins by saying the key is, you've got to turn back to me. Isaiah, who had prophesied of the captivity long before it took place, and Isaiah 55 and verse 6 said, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. God seeks to have mercy. God seeks to pardon, but there are conditions. As he says here, you've got to seek the Lord. You have got to forsake the wicked way. Turn from the unrighteous thoughts. The New Testament is the story of Jesus dying for our sins. As all know, the word gospel means good news. But the good news is for those who are willing to repent. 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish. And what comes next? But that all should come to repentance. The difference between perishing and repentant, uh, perishing and not perishing is Repentance. Hebrews 5, verse 9, Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to those who obey Him. I've got, as, it, as you can see on the title, on the slide here, four lessons. The next three I consider lessons of encouragement. But they're only lessons of encouragement for people who are willing to repent and listen to God. Let that be us. But well, then he turns to the thought of the Lord reigning over the nations. And he begins the visions. Verse 7, On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Barakiah, the son of Iddo, the prophet. I saw by night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse. And it stood among the myrtle trees in the hollow. And behind him were horses, red, sorrel, and white. Then I said, My Lord, what are these? So the angel who talked with me said to me, I will show you what they are. And the man who stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are the ones whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro throughout the earth. So they answered the angel of the Lord who stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro throughout the earth, and behold, all the earth is resting quietly. Now, you've got this image, this vision of horses. They're different colors. And, as, and Zechariah says, well, what is all of this about? And he said, well, these are my scouts to go out through all the world and see what's going on. Well, we realize God is not literally sending out horses to find out. But just as they would have sent out spies and reconnaissance scouts 
on horseback. God is picturing here that a way of saying, I'm keeping an eye on things. My eye is running throughout the earth. And notice what the report is. The report is that the earth is resting quietly. Now, in my Bible, it's the same opening. You may have to flip back a page. But I want you to notice something Haggai has just recently said. And both Haggai and Zechariah, they give us dates for their prophecies. Haggai had said in chapter 2, verse 6, well, the Lord said in Haggai, For thus says the Lord of hosts, Once more, it is a little while, and I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations. Verse 20, And again the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth, I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms and overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. Now I want you to, to put these two things together. Haggai has just prophesied that the Lord is ready to shake things up. And it makes clear when he says, I'm going to shake in chapter 2, 21 and 22. He means overthrow. This is a violent shaking. And yet, when the book of Zechariah opens, he says the, the earth is resting quietly. Well, that's going to change. Look at verse 12. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which you were angry these 70 years? And the Lord answered the angel who talked to me with good and comforting words. So the angel who spoke with me said to me, Proclaim, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am zealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great zeal. I am exceedingly angry with the nations at ease. For I was a little angry, and they helped, but with evil intent. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, says the Lord of hosts, and a surveyor's line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Again proclaim, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, my city shall again spread out through prosperity. The Lord will again comfort Zion and will again choose Jerusalem. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and there were four horns. And I said to the angel who talked with me, What are these? So he answered me, These are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. And I said, what are these coming to do? So he said, These are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one could lift up his head, but the craftsmen are coming to terrify them, to cast out the horns of the nations that lifted up their horn against the land of Judah to scatter it. Now, there's a lot in all of this, but let's just look at what he's saying. He, the angel of the Lord asked the question. This time it's the angel, not Zechariah. How long before you show real mercy to Judah and Jerusalem? And it says in verse 13, The Lord answered the angel with good and comforting words. What follows in all of this was intended to bring comfort. And he looks at the nations, and we would think back to Assyria taking Israel into captivity. We think of Babylon taking Judah into captivity. They were God's instruments of judgment. And what he's saying in verse 15 is, they helped me with my anger 
toward Israel and Judah, but their intent was never to help me. Their intent was evil, and so therefore they're going to be punished. In verse 16, he says, Jerusalem is going to receive mercy. But in verse 21, those horns, and in the Bible, horns often signified power and strength. The horns represented the strength of those nations. And he said the craftsmen are coming to terrify them, to cast out the power of those nations. Now, one thing that if you are really thinking about this, he talks about casting out the nations that lifted up their horn against the land of Judah to scatter it. Well, the Assyrian kingdom has already been destroyed. The Babylonian kingdom had fallen 19 years before this. How is he going to raise up these craftsmen and terrify the horn that scattered them? And I think the idea is that the nations of the world, the Assyrian kingdom was succeeded by the Babylonian kingdom, and the Babylonian by the Persian, and the Persian would be followed by the Greek, and the Greek by the Roman. And all of these were ultimately the enemies of God's people. And God was going to bring judgment upon them. God was going to take care of His people. The key thought to me in all of this, though, is that the Lord has His horses as it were, going throughout the earth. They see. They know what's going on. And when the Lord needs to use a nation of this world to bring judgment, He will use it. And if they do so, as He says, with evil intent, then He will punish them. But God will always comfort His Zion. Verse 17, My cities shall again spread out through prosperity. The Lord will again comfort Zion and will again choose Jerusalem. I have to live with the realization wherever I, whatever nation I live in, wherever my citizenship happens to be, mine is in the United States of America. There may be someone listening to this, watching this now or later, that lives in Zimbabwe, that lives in India, that lives in the Philippines, somewhere else. Wherever we live, we have to realize that the Lord who reigns over the earth sometimes brings judgment upon evil nations. And what nation on earth is there that has not done evil? But if... I have chosen that heavenly Jerusalem, that Mount Zion that he spoke of in Hebrews 12, then I can expect God's comfort. I can expect God to be with me because we're going to find peace and security without walls. Keep going, chapter 2, verse 1. Then I raised my eyes and looked. And behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. Now, here's somebody, you know, we'd have a measuring tape. He may have had a rod of some type. But we're, we're familiar with the idea of measuring land, buildings. I said, where are you going? And he said to me, to measure Jerusalem to see what is its width and what is its length. And there was the angel who talked with me going out, and another angel was coming out to meet him, who said to him, Run, speak to the young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls because of the multitude of men and livestock in it. For I, says the Lord, 
will be a wall of fire all around her. And I will be the glory in her midst. These words were initially intended to encourage these people who've come back from captivity and who are but a small remnant of the nation that once inhabited the land. That God is saying to them, don't get caught up in measuring. And, you know, the city was small compared to what it had once been. The population was low. He doesn't want them to think in those terms. But I believe he is intentionally using language that would not be literally fulfilled. He says that Jerusalem will be inhabited as towns without walls. Oh, we all know one of the Bible heroes of the return is Nehemiah. And his job was to build the wall around Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem would be a walled city. And yet, even with that wall, what would happen to physical Jerusalem? After the Persian Empire, they would fall to the control of the Greeks. And between the Testaments, two competing Greek empires, the Seleucids to the north and the Ptolemies to the south in Egypt, would trade control of Egypt back and forth several times. And then not long before the time of Christ, the Romans would take control of Jerusalem. The physical city of Jerusalem, because of the sins of the people, because of the fact that they didn't truly follow the Lord, would be invaded. What he is doing here is, in what is to me a beautiful and poetic way, saying, this is what my New Testament church is going to be like. I want you to think of three things that he says here. Without walls. And that's the idea of secure. Then he says, well, there will be a wall. I'll be the wall of fire around her. The Lord would be the protector. And then he says in verse 5, there will be glory. Where, why will there be glory? Because I will be the glory in her midst. Look at a couple of New Testament passages. Ephesians, the second chapter, verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And I might just say, being built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets should link us back to our very first point about we've got to listen to God. But those who listen, look at what they become. In whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. In Zechariah, he says, I will be the glory in her midst. In the New Testament, he says the church is his temple in which through his Spirit he dwells. In the fifth chapter of Ephesians, we read this about husbands and wives. And oftentimes we focus on that husband-wife relationship. But think for a moment of what he says about the church in verses 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might Saint, that he might cleanse her. I'm sorry, let me back up again. Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, 
not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Let me ask you, what makes the church glorious? Is it because you and I are so glorious? No. It is because He has cleansed us. It is because He is in our midst that we have been made His dwelling place in the Spirit. Back in the third chapter of Zechariah, he uses the high priest Joshua. And of course, understand this is not the Joshua who led them into the land of Canaan after the death of Moses, this many years later. But the high priest is named Joshua. And on more than one occasion in the book, he uses Joshua to illustrate something of the glorious future with the Christ. And look at verse 8 beginning. Hear, O Joshua the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for they are a wondrous sign. For behold, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua. Upon the stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave its inscription, says the Lord of hosts. And I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. God was looking toward that time when there would be the true high priest. The true servant, Jesus, would come as the high priest and he would remove iniquity. But I want you to focus on that last phrase. In that day, everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. Now that may seem like a strange expression to us. And if you're not familiar with a couple of other Old Testament passages, it will really seem strange. But in 1 Kings, the fourth chapter, when he was describing the reign of Solomon and he describes its riches and its peace, here's the expression he used. 1 Kings 4 and verse 24. He had dominion over all the region on this side of the river, from Tifsa even to Gaza, namely over all the kings on this side of the river. And he had peace on every side all around him. And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, each man under his vine and his fig tree, from Dan as far as Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. It was a time of peace and security. People were not in the houses with the doors barred, you know, bars on the window, locks on the doors. They could sit out comfortably under the vine and the fig tree. It's a picture of security. Micah had used a similar picture. In Micah, the fourth chapter, in a passage very similar to Isaiah 2, Micah adds this note. Verse 4, but everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree and no one shall make them afraid for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. When people listen to God, when people come in obedience to Jesus and they are now a part of that heavenly Jerusalem, that spiritual Mount Zion, that kingdom that cannot be shaken, they feel as though there is a wall of fire around them and that nothing can harm them. They feel secure under their vine and their fig tree. We sometimes sing a song, It is well with my soul. And it it says, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, 
Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. I hope that we start off first, that we understand we've got to be those people who listen. That we're not like the old fathers, he says, who didn't listen to the former prophets and suffered. If we'll listen to God, though, I hope that we have that sense of security, of peace. The last lesson is about a choice. Will it be Babylon or will it be Zion? Verse 6 starts with urgency. I mean, hear this in the voice of the prophet. Up, up, flee from the land of the north, says the Lord. For I have spread you abroad like the four winds of heaven, says the Lord. Up, Zion, escape you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon. For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoil for their servants." Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. For behold, I am coming, and I will dwell in your midst, says the Lord. Many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and they shall become my people. And I will dwell in your midst. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And the Lord will take possession of Judah as his inheritance in the Holy Land. And will again choose Jerusalem. Be silent all flesh before the Lord. For he is aroused from his holy habitation. Those words in verses 6 and 7. Up! Escape! Certainly they were intended to have some immediate application. To remove yourselves from the filth of the nations around you. Come and be a part of this holy temple that's to be built but there is also here being addressed a mindset he speaks of escape you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon Babylon had already fallen what is being depicted here is a choice of mentalities in the revelation 17 and 18 You remember the great harlot is Babylon, the one who was drunk on the blood of the saints. Not literal Babylon, but that wicked opponent of God's people. And here he's saying, which do you want to be? Do you want to be like Babylon or a part of Zion? And in verse 10, When he says, sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. I am coming, I will dwell in your midst. Many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day. Well, that is so much like chapter 9. In verse 9, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. It speaks of his dominion is from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. There can be no doubt that when Zechariah speaks of the daughter of Zion singing and rejoicing in verse 10, that he intended, or the Lord intended, it to have application to us who live under the Christ who came riding into Jerusalem on a colt, the foal of a donkey, to symbolize he was coming as a different king. He wasn't coming to reign over physical Jerusalem. He would have come with a war horse. But he came on the lowly donkey, reigning over the hearts of men worldwide. But I want you to see a couple of things here that I think are really important. I mean, the first one is we've got to ask ourselves, what what do we want to be a part of? You know, we live in Babylon. And again, I don't care where you live. 
If you live in America, in Canada, Mexico, Philippines, India, Brazil, Russia, wherever, you live in Babylon. The culture, the religious mindset, everything, you know, at least in some ways, is going to be contrary to God. That doesn't mean that we can't have any part of this world. But it means we've got to decide whose people we want to be. And if we are God's people, then we ought to sing and rejoice. Verse 8, look at this unusual expression. He who touches you touches the apple of his eye. The Bible says so much about humility that we don't want to let ourselves become filled with pride. But do we realize, do we stop to think that if we have chosen the mindset of Zion instead of the mindset of Babylon, we're the apple of his eye? That we are special to God? That he cares about us? And that you don't mess with the apple of his eye. That's why he's the wall of fire about us. Why he will guard us. And he says, sing and rejoice. We need to be excited. Excited about being the people of God. Excited about knowing that the Lord is reigning over the nations and it is for the benefit of his people, for the comfort of his Zion, that he will provide peace and security, that we are the apple of his eye if we've chosen to listen to him. Let us rejoice always, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 says. Sing and rejoice, he says. In chapter 9, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Let us, who are God's people, be excited, thrilled to be God's people. What a great message that is. There's so much in the prophets that should be of value to us. And I hope it will be. I hope that I've piqued your interest in this book. I hope that I have stirred up within you the realization that if you're a child of God, you can have great joy. And if you're not a child of God, you're not a faithful child of God, you're really missing out on something. I hope you'll make things right with Him. Let's close this out with a period of prayer. O oh God, our Father, what a wonderful privilege it is to call you our Father, to be able to know that you are that wall of fire about us, that Jesus is in our midst, that we can be a glorious church not because of ourselves, but because you have cleansed us, that you have washed us with the blood of Christ, and that our glory comes from the fact that He is with us. Thank you for sending Emmanuel to be with us. Though His flesh is no longer upon this earth, we are confident that Jesus is with us if we are with you. Help us, Father, to have hearts that will return to you so that you will always return to us. Help us to have a mindset that is spiritual in nature, a mind set on things above, not on things of the earth. For we realize, Father, that 
the Babylons of this world will be shaken. But the heavenly Jerusalem will be unshaken. Thank you for the great privileges you give us in Christ. And Father, we, even as we rejoice in all of this, we have hearts of concern tonight. So many of our number are sick. We pray for all of them. We pray for our brother who is undergoing surgery tomorrow. And we pray that that goes well with him. And that you give him a speedy recovery. And we realize, Father, that this awful virus that has afflicted our congregation heavily at this moment is hurting people all over the world. And we pray for all the people of this world. We pray that the vaccines will be able to do their work and do it quickly. But Father, help us in the midst of all of this to be able to honestly say, it is well with my soul. For Lord, we know that you have never abandoned us. You never will. Help us keep our faith, our trust in you. We love you, Father, knowing that you have first loved us. And we pray that you would forgive us, strengthen us, and in the name of that glorious one who dwells among us, we offer this prayer and amen. Thank you for watching this video. We're glad that you have found our channel. And in fact, while you're here, we would encourage you to subscribe to the Jones Road Church of Christ channel. We have several videos already up and we believe you'll find these to be true to God's word helpful to you in your journey toward God. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us and let us know how we can help you.